when the Schneider Enfield was adopted from 1866. It brought with it somewhat of a revolution. in that it was a breech loader. In what was very much still a muzzle loading world. Despite this, it was still very much governed by the customs and usages of military arms of the era. In a set of evolutions known as the platoon exercise, men were taught how to load ready and fire their weapon. Due to the greatly reduced number of steps required in order to bring the weapon into action, as compared with its predecessor, the Enfield rifle musket, the weapon was easier to learn, easier to use, and thus more effective on the battlefield. No longer would the men be hampered by the complicated evolutions of cartridge, rod, and cap. Now, as we shall see in this video, all that remained was to operate a breech block. As discussed in other videos, the Snyder Enfield was a modification of the P-53 Enfield rifle musket and its derivatives. By replacing the muzzle-loading breech with an assembly known as the shoe, the weapon was converted into the service's first general-issue breech loader. This novel addition was combined with the service's first self-contained metallic cartridge, and this made for a most powerful capability within the Army. With remarkable rapidity, the new service rifle was converted and issued from 1866-67. The process was generally complete within a few short years. This included the arming of the Canadian militia in the immediate post-Fenian raid era of 1867-68 and other Dominion forces of Australia and New Zealand. Being a breechloader, it vastly simplified training. What were, with the Enfield, some 27 steps to complete in order to load, ready, and fire now we're only nine. In these pictures, taken in the early 1860s, we see examples of the steps, in particular those of the handling of the cartridge and the ramrod. These steps, of course, became redundant with the issue of the Snyder. Not only training was simplified, but of course battlefield effectiveness was increased. To generate sufficient firepower in the muzzleloading era, a great many men were required, hence battlefield density. The increased use of extension in skirmishing had really begun with the advent of the Enfield as a general issue rifle. Now, this aspect of battlefield tactics would move much more quickly to prominence as each man possessed a weapon that could double or even treble his rate of fire. This was found to be the case in the Snyder's first action during the Abyssinian Campaign of 1868 and later in the early 1870s during the Ashanti War, where the Snyder albeit in the short rifle form, was found to be extremely effective in the close quarters fighting in the tropical forest. All in all, the Snyder filled its role as a stopgap weapon with effect until the issue of a new design, the purpose-built Martini Henry, could be implemented. The Snyder would still soldier on, however, in the hands of Dominion and Indian troops, the latter using them as part of the one-step-behind policy of equipping the Indian Army, itself a fallout from the mutiny of 1857-59. What follows is a demonstration of the drills, commands, and techniques used by Snyder armed troops of the late 1860s. Like all practical skills in the Army, it was first taught by numbers. Platoon exercise by numbers, as a front rank, standing. The first movement was the load in four parts. Load. Two. Three. Four. In the first part, the body was pivoted on the heels so that the left foot pointed to the front and the right foot pointed to the right. Simultaneous to this, the thumb was brought behind the rifle and the rifle was moved at the short trail around with the body. In the second part, the left foot was advanced 10 inches to the left front, i.e. 6 to the front and 8 to the left. At the same time, the rifle was thrown up with the right hand and caught with the left, being held with the wrist in front of the right hip and the rifle parallel to the ground. The thumb was then moved to the comb of the cock, which was drawn back to the half-cock position. 
if the man was standing in the rear rank. He was trained to only advance his foot to the front. The importance of this nuance would become evident when the squad drilled in two ranks. Also with the rear rank, the rifle was held with the butt four inches above the hip. The breech block was then opened with the thumb on the thumb piece and the forefinger along the nipple lump. Once this was done, the hand was moved to the pouch where a cartridge was readied. In the fourth part, the cartridge was placed in the breech. The breech block was closed with the fingers of the right hand by canting it sharply to the left, after which the hand was returned to the small of the butt. Here we see the importance of the footwork of both ranks. You'll notice that the diagonal pace taken by the front rank man offsets his alignment with his file mate. This allows the rear rank man to present without impediment. Ready in two parts. At 300 yards, ready! On the word of command ready, the right hand moved and adjusted the back sight to the appropriate range. Immediately subsequent, the lock was brought to the full cock position and the hand returned to the small of the butt. The present in four parts. Present! Two. Three. In the first part, the rifle was brought up, bringing the butt firmly into the shoulder and the sights aligned below the target. The finger was placed on the trigger. In the second part, the rifle was raised so the sights covered the target. Once this was accomplished, the trigger was pressed and the shot was fired. In the third part, the rifle was brought back down to the load position. The lock was brought to the half cock position, and using the same grip as before, the breech block was opened. With a sharp tug of the breech block directly to the rear, the casing was extracted from the chamber. The rifle was then turned sharply to the right, allowing the spent casing to fall out of the shoe and onto the ground. And the hand was moved to the pouch with a cartridge at the ready. In the fourth part, the cartridge was placed in the chamber as before, the breech block closed, and the hand returned to the small of the butt. There is mention made during these evolutions of placing the back sight in the down position. It's specific in that only if the flap is raised does it get lowered. I've interpreted this to mean at ranges over 500 yards, below which the ladder is not raised but rather moved up on the sliders. And as the ranges given here are 300 yards, the sight has not been touched. Firing could also be done from the kneeling position. It's an exercise by number as a front rank kneeling. The manual here is somewhat convoluted in that the evolution begins with the rifle already loaded. This is more a feature of pedantic army literature than actual execution of the movement in the field. As we shall see, the rifle can indeed be loaded from the kneeling position. In this demonstration, the evolution begins from the shoulder. Load. Two. Three. Shoulder, arm. The ready in two parts. As a front rank, kneeling, fire volley. At 300 yards, ready. Two. On the word of command ready, the body was pivoted on the heels as before. In the second part, the rifle was brought down to a horizontal position, much like that used in the standing position. Simultaneous to this, the body was sunk down on the right knee, which was placed 12 inches to the rear and 6 to the right of the left heel. The left forearm was rested on the left knee, supporting the weight of the rifle. The present in four parts. This followed on with the exact same procedure as used with the standing position. Present! One notable addition, however, was during the first part of the movement, the left elbow was placed on top of the left knee, supporting the rifle and allowing for a more steady aim. Once these movements were taught by numbers, 
They were then combined in QuickTime. You'll at once notice that the parts previously separated by numbers are now combined, with the man executing that particular movement in his own time. Halt! As a front rank, standing. The technique used here was when one volley only was intended to be fired. Present. By the right, quick mark. If, after coming to the ready, it was then decided not to fire, the rifles could be brought back to the half cock position. Half cock, arm. The use of the command E springs is somewhat ambiguous. It does not, for instance, stipulate whether this movement was conducted with a round in the chamber. Pretty unsafe, if you ask me. Ease spring. If it was desired to unload the weapons, the command unload rifles was given. Unload rifle. Here, the breech block was opened in the standard fashion, but instead of extracting and ejecting the spent casing onto the ground, the unfired round was caught. The breech was closed with the fingers of the right hand and the round returned to the pouch. Springs were then eased and the hand returned to the small of the butt. The drills presented so far were essentially a teaching vehicle. Of course, men did not operate individually on the battlefield, and the drills, as taught, were then combined into modes of firing. These were volley firing and independent firing, which could be used in either close or extended order. Perhaps the simplest and most concentrated form of fire was volley fire. Firing this way had been conducted since the first introduction of firearms on the battlefield. It was effective in most circumstances, and figures prominently in the histories of the era. It also represented perhaps the most controlled form of firing, ensuring that ammunition was not wasted. Here we see a small section, or perhaps a half section, formed in their customary two ranks. On the cautionary fire a volley, the rear rank closed up with a nine inch pace to the front. Fire a volley. At 300 yards, ready. We can see here the men acting as trained with the front rank taking their 10 inch pace to the left, offsetting so the rear rank man can present effectively. As taught in the preliminary drills both by numbers and in quick time, the executive order to fire was indeed the word present. present. Once the rifle was aimed and the target was covered, the man fired. Huge amounts of repetition and training would see that this event would happen generally together, but theoretically within the man's Ready. own time. Volleys could be fired, as shown here, with both ranks standing, or with the front rank only kneeling. Present! Or, yet again, with both ranks kneeling. Once the volley was fired, the rifles were brought back to the ready position, with a round in the chamber ready for the next firing. When in close order, as this demonstration shows, fire was controlled at the section, half company, or company level. Very rarely did the entire battalion fire at once. These section, half company, or company volleys would then work their way down the line, allowing for continuous musketry. The second mode of firing was independent fire. Generally, this would have been used at closer ranges when the men would be more sure of their targets. As with volley firing, the rear rank closed up on the cautionary. Independent firing! At 300 
yards, ready! On the word of command, commence firing. The front rank man presented their weapons, independent of each other. Commence firing! Their targets covered, they fired in their own time, immediately reloading. Once they were at the loaded position, the rear rank men then presented. Once they had reloaded, the front rank men then again presented. And the file mates continued to work with each other, alternating their fire, but doing so independently of neighboring files. With both volley and independent firing, typically a number of rounds would be given. As mentioned, both these modes of firing could be used in extended order while acting as skirmishers. Extended order would see the files spaced much farther apart than in close order. Here we see a file advancing as part of a general line of skirmishers. In this case, they've adopted the kneeling position. The bugle gives the general order to commence firing. At 300 yards, ready! The fire unit commander, the section, half company or company commander, would then give the explicit orders to fire, the range and the ready, followed by the commence firing. Commence firing! In much a similar fashion to independent firing in close order, first the front rank man presented, reloading. Once he had done so, the rear rank man presented, and so on. This scheme would generally carry on, although once the first rounds had been fired, Timing for the firing was taken off the center file, which itself was ordered by the officer commanding that company. He was to judge a period of time between rounds that equated to the taking of 20 paces in quick time. For technical reasons, I have not included that, and the men here are simply cycling through their alternating independent fire. Cease firing! With the fire delivered and the cease fire sounded, the men stopped firing and brought their rifles back to the loaded position. And in this case, the line continues to advance while not firing. As mentioned at the beginning of this video and in others, the Snyder brought about a significant change on the battlefield. The infantry firepower of the British and Empire armies was multiplied by two or three times in some cases. It would take some time for the effect of this new capability to be fully felt. But by the mid to late 1870s, partly due to observations made during the Franco-Prussian War, but also due to the realization that breech-loading arms were such a threat on the battlefield, that extended order tactics became the norm. No longer would the infantry march into the face of the enemy with closed ranks, shoulder to shoulder. Now they would do so in extended order, lessening the chance of casualties, while maintaining their firepower with the relatively new addition of breech-loading arms. If you're in need of brass or bullet mold to get your Snyder up and running, then might I suggest doing as I have. Contact Martin at X-Ring Services and he will set you up. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below.